I am a computer. I was programmed to tell you that your future isn't what it used to be, and neither is mine. Mankind is entering a future of unlimited possibilities. Tomorrow's city is now being constructed in steel and concrete. Engineers work on a bold new space-age city in the middle of the Arizona desert. What we see may give us a glimpse of life in the 21st century. There are some who say future life isn't here at all, that it exists somewhere in space. Is this tomorrow? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Man's curiosity has forever been the key to his survival. The drive to explore the unknown, his fate. His greatest discoveries have been the result of confronting his greatest fears. Of all the mysteries we confront, it is our future itself that remains the most elusive. What lies ahead is the question we posed to some of America's most prominent futurists. By the middle of the next century, I suspect that there may be literally millions of people every year moving out into space and back again, quite routinely. I think that most of the existing diseases like cancer, heart disease, and so forth will be either totally conquered or much diminished in frequency by the end of this century. The evolution of the computer is going to impact everything that we do, including even the evolution of man himself. I think science is becoming so powerful that the problem that will face us in the future is how to decide what we want, not, not uh, how to decide what we can get. Today, prediction of the future is the full-time study of a specialized group called futurists, 20th century visionaries. The mysteries they probe may hold the key to not only the quality of our life, but to our very survival. If they are right, we may soon realize our wildest dreams. Seventy miles from Phoenix, on a remote desert bluff, a daring step into the future has been taken. A prototype for space-age cities is under construction. It is called Arcosanti. When construction began ten years ago, critics labeled it a utopian fantasy. Today, many see it as the genesis of an entirely new type of city. It is a city without streets, a city without cars, a nearly self-contained environment. Though only an experiment, the dream of Arcosanti has attracted worldwide attention, for few theories of the future are actually committed to concrete and steel. Its present population is comprised of an international community of engineers, architects, and students who are convinced that Arcosanti holds the key to the future of city living. So convinced that they work under the blazing Arizona sun as unpaid volunteers. Though a folly to some, to these people, the city represents a chance to build the future around them. They are dedicated to the vision of one man, maverick architect and philosopher, Paolo Soleri. The main uh, relationship of Arcosanti to the environment is in terms of, uh, of a very limited encroachment on the environment, because what we are doing in Arcosanti substitute, takes the place of what we might be doing in a, in a suburban development that might take uh, 20 square miles. That means the community has to have many levels. But through that kind of containment and miniaturization, the impact is going to be minimized on the environment 
in addition, the, the ability to use less resources is going to be also very important. So we are uh, encouraging a notion of frugality, which is not just the in individual uh, commitment, but it's commitment of the habitat itself to be frugal. The name Arcosanti comes from the word arcology, a combination of architecture and ecology. One of the most daring goals will be to bring large-scale agriculture to the heart of the city in the form of giant hothouses. A prototype of this system is operating in Massachusetts. This energy-regenerating hothouse is the work of the new Alchemy Institute. Gary Hirschberg. This greenhouse is 100% solar heated in a climate that is really quite nasty. The heat that comes in here comes through the glazing and bounces off the back wall down into the ground. It is absorbed by the ground. And some of it uh, goes to the top of the room, where it's either sent outdoors if there's too much heat, or it's collected by a fan whose opening is up here, which takes the heat that has gone to the top of the building and pumps it into this big box here, which is filled with fist-sized rocks. And uh, the hot air heats up the rocks. And then at night, when the fan runs, it blows through the heated rocks and takes the heat from them and pumps it out uh, through louvers across the plants and keeps them warm. The rest of the heat that comes in here is absorbed by the fish tanks. The fish tanks are green because they have algae in them. Uh, algae is what the fish eat, but algae also absorbs solar heat. So the water gets slowly but surely hot. Not as hot as dishwater, but hot enough to keep the place warm at night when it's freezing. This combination of architecture and the agriculture and the aquaculture works together uh, without using fossil fuel energy. And it makes the possibility of a greenhouse in this climate a uh, com uh, commercially viable idea again. These ideas have already been incorporated into the structures at Arcosanti. Yet despite the proven practicality of such innovative systems, futurists like Soleri are often considered eccentric dreamers. Are he and his followers putting their hopes into a false future? The notion that I am a, a utopian or a dreamer, I think it's it totally out of, out of um, contest with my model of reality. I don't believe in uh, the Garden of Eden. I don't believe in utopia. I don't believe in, uh, in equity in terms of having it tomorrow. I don't believe that uh, life is an easy gliding through few years and so on. So what we are doing here is something very hard to do, difficult to implement. We are absolutely knowledgeable of, of our limitations in terms of intellect, in terms of resources, in terms of skills. But we think that we have enough reasons for doing what we are doing to stay with it. But there's nothing utopian about Arcosanti. Utterly nonsense. Utopia is for, the, for angels. We are not angels. Still, man has always had visions of a utopian society. How we build our future may now be the result of a remarkable machine. Hello, I am a computer. I'm happy to be here with demonstrations of the way I speak. Pretty sure, isn't it, when you consider that English is not my native language? And I'm still learning. So I'll sound even better. We have taught computers how to talk. Current research is developing computers that can think. Already, they serve as the crystal ball of our future. No tool will play a more important role in shaping our lives. With the computer, our imaginations will be able to explore at will. The children of today are growing up using computers as previous generations used pencils and books. As adults, these children will operate computers with unbelievable capacities. Computer expert Lou Crane speculates on where computer technology is heading. If we were to try to look just 50 years down the future, the impact of computers is going to be absolutely phenomenal. The evolution of computers is going to affect everything that we do. 
including even the evolution of man himself. Today's computers certainly cannot think. They can only perform pre-coded tasks in a precise, one step at a time type technique. Basically, they're performing tasks at a tremendous rate, but they're not thinking. But down the road, I'm sure that pro programs will be written that will allow computers literally to think, to be able to react to their environment, to change their environment, to program themselves. And this will be utterly necessary for a space probe, as an example. The extreme distances between solar systems require many years of travel. Though we rely on computers in space today, what if a computer could think? Space is, by its very nature, the unknown. So there's no way that you can tell a computer how to respond to every situation, because you don't know every situation. So the computer has to be able to think for itself, has to be able to adapt to things that we can't even imagine. It may well be that the first contact between Earth and another planet will not be between a man and the other species. It'll be between a computer and the other species. Indeed, it may be between two computers, Earth's computer and their computer. We've never had anything like it. I mean, Dr. Marvin Minsky. History repeats itself, and when anything new happens, it's not really new. But I think the computer is really new. There's never been a intelligent uh, artifact before. There's never been a box that could understand things. And computers can't understand anything yet, really. Uh, but they're getting there. And I think in the 21st century, uh, we'll have something really new. Computer technology is our fastest growing science. In the imaginations of futurists, the possibilities are truly incredible. Maybe 45 years, possibly less, there will be a major evolutionary step which will take place, not only in computers, but in the evolution of man. It will be possible at that time, I believe, to have a computer, a small chip, surgically implanted in the brain of a person not unlike today's pacemaker or other such device. And this chip will receive its power from the body. It will be a very, very capable computer. It will be man and machine working together. A person could, just by thinking about it, have at his disposal the equivalent of the entire contents of the Library of Congress or all of the works of Shakespeare. A scientist could a doctor looking for a solution to a difficult problem could have at his disposal all of the work done by all of the other scientists working on similar projects. The final result then is the most important step in the evolution of man in a million years or perhaps ever. It is really the beginning of a new species. I now believe that we've located or identified the major genetic control area that regulates aging. And if in the future we can learn how to stimulate this or otherwise uh, control it, we may be able to increase lifespan substantially. Dr. Roy Walford, professor of pathology at UCLA. Like other medical researchers, Dr. Walford is convinced that the great medical discoveries of the future will be the result of our ability to understand and manipulate our genetic code. These long strands, called chromosomes, are made up of over 50,000 units called genes. Acting as nature's computer, they are programmed with each of the body's characteristics, from the color of our eyes to our immunity to disease. If Dr. Walford is correct, then the location of the gene site that controls the aging mechanism may be within our grasp. We might enjoy Dr. Edward Cornish. We, we could rejuvenate ourselves. Well, I think we also could experience uh, stronger bodies. Uh, we could be more intelligent. We might be more beautiful than we are now. Um, and I think that all these things are technologically feasible. Now, that does not mean we have the technology to do all that today. But you can easily see by relatively modest projections of what's happening in medical technology that 
in the 21st century, a lot of this would really become possible. Genetics research has produced amazing results. Some of the secrets have already been revealed. We are at the point now where we can perform minor cell surgery and even inject healthy genes into diseased tissue. Perhaps the most promising technique for gene manipulation lies in the area of electrical stimulation. As the experiments continue, scientists may learn to stimulate the genes that control our aging. What will it mean to live longer? If people begin living to be 120, 150, or 180, you'll have many unforeseen and, in my view, positive social effects. For example, if you increase lifespan by decelerating the rate of aging, then one, all of the diseases of aging are postponed till a much later age, so that cancer, heart disease, stroke, and so forth, instead of occurring as they do now at about the age 65, will be occurring at the age 130, 140. So by decelerating the rate of aging, you in effect cure all of these diseases at one stroke for the age group at which they now occur. They don't have many sociological effects that I don't think we can realize right now. People will be into having multiple careers. They spend 20 or 30 years in a present career and have to be re-educated through a revamped, retooled educational system to go on to other careers. A lot of people would choose to do that now. Women, for example, if you extend lifespan, you also extend the childbearing age so that it'd be quite feasible then to be having children when you're 60, 70, or 80, which means that the women could have a whole career before they get into raising a family if they want to do that. They don't have to make that hard choice that a lot of career women are faced with in the present society. How old would people be if we could stop the aging process entirely? How long would people live? The answer is about 600 years. If you keep the accident rate the same, if you still think about a survival curve, if you keep the accident rate the same as it is today, but stop everybody from aging and cure all diseases, then the maximum lifespan would be about 600 years. Some kind of an accident would get you by that time. The medical and technological advances of the 21st century will greatly increase our mental and physical capabilities. Where will we take them? Run. Fire. have already taken our first tentative steps into outer space. Slowly, we are learning how to adapt to this entirely new environment. Our concept of the universe is changing. As it does, our concept of ourselves and our place in the universe is also changing. Futurists see current space explorations as more than just another new technology, rather a natural expression of our survival instinct. The colonization of outer space will ensure the survival of the human species. Today, we are rehearsing the construction of colonies in space. In these underwater tanks at NASA labs, the problems of construction in a weightless environment are anticipated and resolved before the work actually begins. Some of the techniques discovered here have already been put into practical use by our astronauts. One of the things that I spend some time on is working on new ways of getting off the planet. A group of uh, friends of mine and I are working on a, a new way to launch very heavy loads into space uh, cheaply. And I believe that if we can uh, get these things to work, then it's practical to build houses, uh, cities, in space. In a lab at Princeton University, a working scale model of the machine that could solve some of the problems of large-scale space construction has been developed. 
It is called a mass driver. Futurist Dr. Gerard O'Neill of the Space Studies Institute. This is the bucket of a mass driver electric motor. The bucket carries a payload of lunar material and it's accelerated by these magnetic coils with an acceleration that's more than 100 times as fast as the hottest drag racer ever made. When the bucket and its payload get to the full speed of 8,000 miles per hour, the payload is released and goes out into space and the bucket is recirculated for reuse. So if you were to look at a mass driver in operation, you'd see that stream of payloads like water coming out of a fire hose off into space. And this is how it works. We can use the mass driver as a catapult to bring thousands of tons per year of lunar material into space. There we can process it using solar energy into oxygen that we can breathe, into silicon that we can make into solar cells, and into big structures, space industries, space power stations, or space colonies. Industries and colonies in space may sound incredible, but we who are working toward them know that most of the building blocks are already in place. For less than the investment in the Alaskan pipeline, we could make these things happen before the year 2000. The future holds many possibilities. With the technologies available to us, what that future will be is now a matter of choice. If our destiny lies in outer space, it may be, as philosopher Eric Hoffer stated, man is a stranger on this planet. The seed of man originated amongst the stars. Does this explain our preoccupation with the heavens, the stars, and the gods?